It's good to see all of you here today. I mean, it's a pleasure to be standing in front of you, but I also mean it literally that the lights are on. Because today we're speaking about Indestroyer, malware that's capable of causing a blackout. In fact, it already caused one in Ukraine last December. But there's more. It's the first ever malware specifically designed to attack power grids. And we consider it to be the biggest threat against industrial control systems since Duxnet. My name is Robert Lipovsky, and together with my colleague Anton Cherepanov, we analyze malware and investigate cyber attacks on a daily basis. And in fact, both of us have been doing it for 10 years now. But I got to be honest with you, when we discovered Indestroyer last December, we were blown away. So we're based in Slovakia, EU. We work as malware researchers for ESET, the company that pioneered anti-malware heuristics and has been innovating anti-malware solutions for the past 30 years. And we're happy to be on stage today with our fellow researchers from Dragos. Perfect. So my name is Rob Lee, uh, CEO of Dragos. I started my career in the U.S. intelligence community uh, looking at nation states breaking into industrial environments. Uh, some of you may have seen me since over at the Sands Institute where I teach the ICS courses and the threat intelligence course. And uh, I have the privilege of being on stage today. I was really excited to be here, so I'll pass it over to Ben. Yeah, um, my name is Ben. Uh, I lead the Threat Operations Center at uh, Dragos, and we were part of the one of two teams that helped uh, focus on crash override and really uh, focused on the uh, aspects of impact to the grid and, and what crash override actually did. And last, uh, my name is Joe Slowick. I'm also at Dragos. I'm a threat researcher or hunter, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, I was also at Los Alamos National Laboratory before joining the company, and I have a background in the U.S. Navy and other similar aspects. And it was exciting not that long after I joined Dragos to get involved in this particular project so soon. So fun times. Okay, so let's take a quick look at our agenda today. First, we'll put Industrial into context of the other malware that targeted ICS in the past. Then we'll walk you through how it works. And then our friends from Dragos will talk more about its capabilities and possible impact scenarios. No, they chose to use a different name for it, but don't be confused. We're talking about the same malware here. And then they will conclude with predictions of things to come. But first, let's stop for a moment and take a look at how ICS targeting malware works in general. So we have an industrial site, which can be anything from a uranium enrichment plant to an automobile factory with a specialized industrial hardware. These devices, they're controlled and configured by human operators from workstations. And that was the point of infiltration for all the known ICS targeting malware families. Well, where the families differ is in their capability and methods of disrupting the industrial process. Specifically, Indestroyer was designed to attack electricity distribution substations. There's a timer in the analyzed sample set to the time of the blackout in Kiev, Ukraine, last December, that triggers Indestroyer's unique payload, controlling circuit breakers automatically through industrial communication protocols in order to cut the power. So with that, it joined this elite club of only three malware families known to be used in attacks against ICS. Stuxnet, which needs no introduction, was able to reprogram PLCs to change the rotation speed of centrifuges. Havex, the malware used in operations known as Dragonfly or Energetic Bear, it infected many industrial sites, and it also used the OPCDA protocol, which is used also by Indestroyer, by the way. But unlike Indestroyer, Havex only used it for espionage. Black Energy is a bit different from the other three families. We've been tracking it since 2011, and there were many campaigns over those years, mostly spear phishing. We even discovered when they used a zero day, that's CV 2014 4014 that many of you may be familiar with. So there were many campaigns over those years against many high value targets. But what's relevant to our topic today are the campaigns against the Ukrainian power grid. They started in March 2015, and on December 23rd, culminated in the first known malware-enabled blackout that affected several regions in the country and left around 230,000 people without light for several hours. As I said, Black Energy is a bit different from these other tool sets. It wasn't designed to target ICS specifically, but is a more general purpose cyber weapon. Through its network lateral movement and espionage modules, it paved the way for attackers who then used Radmin, 
legitimate remote access software installed at the power distribution companies to manually pull the plug. And this is an actual video taken by an operator while the attackers were remotely accessing their system. But now on to the main topic. So on December 17th, 2016, that's almost exactly one year after the previous blackout, we were struck with a sense of deja vu. There was another blackout and we started analyzing samples of malware which became the main suspect in Destroyer. We sent our analysis to Ukraine and that had to wait not to interfere with ongoing investigations. We were allowed to share with the finished report with Dragos under TLP Amber and then publish after getting the green light in June. So we already mentioned what Indestroyer can do and did. Now let's take a look under the hood. It begins with the main backdoor, which takes care of the CNC communication la and launches the other components. I mean, the backdoor itself, it's not super interesting. It's the typical malware, the kind we analyze thousands of every day. Uh, here's the list of commands that it supports. Indestroyer doesn't focus on espionage like Black Energy did, for example, but it does provide attackers capability of downloading and executing additional modules, therefore expanding its functionality, as well as the capability to exfiltrate files off the infected machine. The last command in this list is used to ensure persistence, that it survives a reboot. It does that by pointing the image path registry value uh, of a chosen existing Windows service to a more obfuscated version of itself. There is also a secondary backdoor. It's used as a backup mechanism in case the main backdoor gets detected or disabled. I mean, the bad guys, they want to ensure they stay in once they get in. And it's interesting because it masquerades as a trojanized and otherwise fully functional version of Windows Notepad, which it replaces in the system. There are a few additional tools. Uh, the only really noteworthy ones are a trojanized, uh, sorry, the only really noteworthy ones are a port scanner which the attackers chose to implement instead of using a readily available tool such as Nmap, for example, and a denial of service tool, but that actually impacts the ICS and I'll talk about it later. But now we're getting to the interesting part. So we identify three distinct ways industrial attacks electricity substations. Firstly, and most importantly, it can directly control the industrial hardware on site. So you may be asking, what is this hardware? Well, it can be remote terminal units or intelligent electronic devices, typically protection relays. On these photos, you can see examples from two vendors, Siemens and ABB. And there are many types of such devices, but they're basically their functionality is to open and close circuit breakers for the purposes of protection, balancing the power grid, and so on. And these devices, they're configured and monitored using specialized SCADA software on regular workstations, typically running Windows. Here we've prepared a couple of examples of such software. And the communication itself towards those devices and from those devices, it happens through one of industrial communication protocols. Again, there are several of those protocols. Some of them are regionally specific. Uh, some of them operate over uh, serial connections, others over TCP IP. But overall, the idea is the same, to send commands to the devices. Now, we should note that Indestroyer abuses these protocols. There are no exploits, no software vulnerabilities per se. It uses the protocols in the way they were designed to be used decades ago without particular paying attention to security. But now I'll let Anton, the lead in our industrial analysis, walk you through the payloads. Hi, everyone. Uh, Robert mentioned the ecstatic the timing of industrial attack, that's the job of uh, launcher component. The launcher component we analyzed uh, would launch the individual uh, payload models on December 17, uh, shortly before power outage. We identified uh, models capable of controlling uh, devices through for uh, communication protocols, IEC 101, IEC 104, uh, 61850, and OPC data that, that access. Most of them are DLL files, and they have own con configuration files. Uh, here is an example of uh, first payload, 101. It uh, requires configuration file. Here is uh, 
example of configuration file. It uh, communicates over serial connection the COM ports to use uh, specified in configuration. And first thing it does, it uh, kills legitimate process on the workstation work that's responsible for communication with devices and takes over. Uh, and these devices, they operate on something that called IOA, Information Object Address. Uh, think of, of, about them as uh, network ports or re registers. There are several uh, types of IOAs, but payload is interested only in two specific ones, uh, which can accept commands. It goes over a range of uh, defined IOAs and sends a command sequence off, then on, then off again. Uh, next payload, uh, and the idea of this 104 payload is very similar to 101. In, in that, it sends on or off uh, commands to the, the devices, but the few differences. It works over TCP IP instead of serial. Uh, and as you can see here in configuration, uh, it is possible to specify multiple uh, station entries. So it will connect, to, it, it can connect to multiple device, devices at the same time. And there are many uh, more configuration options, but uh, most important uh, is uh, uh, operation mode. There are three operation modes, range, shift, and sequence. But for 101 and 104, attackers don't know the type of IOAs. So they have to do a kind of brute force uh, to find out uh, which IOA will accept the command. Uh, the range and shift is used to discover right IOAs and sequence mode is used once they are known. Uh, pay payload construct the packet on the fly and thankfully to Wireshark we can dissect them. And as you can see on the screen, it's a single command type on IOA number 10. Uh, the payload uh, can also write to the console. Here is an example. So attackers can see what's happening in real time. Also, it supports uh, logging. Uh, this example demonstrates the uh, capability of the payload. It tries to switch circuit breakers to on or off in infinite loop. And exact logic depends on the configuration. Either on or off continuously or flipping back and forth between loop iteration. Uh, six, uh, 61850 is a bit different and a bit more advanced. Like 104, it uh, operates over TCP IP, but uh, it can fu function even if IP addresses are not defined because it has auto discover feature. It can discover uh, re relevant devices using. Uh, it scans IP range for. Uh, uh, host that has open port 102. It doesn't operate on IOS, but uh, on named elements. It looks for these hardcoded names. Uh, they uh, correspond to circuit breakers and switches. So it's a different approach, uh, but again, same purpose to open and close circuit breakers. And the last payload is a, uh, is a step above the rest. Uh, not that it's more advanced, but it operates on higher le software abstraction level. Technically, a PC uh, that access can be built on top of 101, 104, or 61850. It uses distributed COM to discover all OPC servers running in the network, obtains their names, searching for these specific tags. Then it writes byte value one to discover it items with this text. But that, what does it mean? Let, uh, let's look to the documentation. 
those tags, they are associated with ABB. Their type is uh, ABB command bit mask. And writing value one on bit po position zero results in normal execution of that command. And this OPC process object tool by IBB help us to translate the commands in the better human readable form. So again, the purpose is the same, opening circuit breakers. And analyzing uh, industrial payloads is a piece of cake for a skilled uh, reverse engineer because they are not obfuscated in any way. But the only thing that, uh, uh, that can slow you down is uh, this annoying comb stuff. So today, we are gonna, going to release uh, the script, either Python script that helps to analyze uh, binaries that use uh, this OPC data access protocol. So it, it will help to analyze any future ma malware that uh, will use this protocol. So check this uh, GitHub account after all talk. This uh, how uh, code looks before the script. And when you use the script, this is how it looks after. Yep. Well, I think all of the reverse engineers in the room will agree that that's much better. So thank you, Anton. So all the four payloads, they serve a similar purpose to open and close circuit breakers. And you may be asking why the attackers chose to implement different payloads for a very similar functionality. Well, writing the malware is one thing, but launching this kind of attack requires a lot more planning and knowledge of the systems of the target. Now, the attackers, they certainly did their homework, but they didn't know everything about the devices in Ukraine, so they had to make the malware more universal to be functional in all possible kinds of scenarios. Now, de-energizing a substation is the most obvious impact scenario, and Dragos will go into more detail about that. The second type of functionality we found in Indestroyer is rendering protection relays irresponsive. This is done by the denial of service tool I mentioned earlier, by exploiting a vulnerability in Siemens CProtec devices, which is described in this ICS cert advisory. The module sends specially crafted UDP packets to port 50,000. Knocking these devices out amplifies the impact of the payloads Anton talked about. The devices become irresponsive and operators have to go and reboot them manually. Now, Siemens did patch the vulnerability in a firmware update, but you can imagine how regularly these kinds of devices are actually updated. The third and final type of payload functionality in industrial samples we analyzed is the data wiper module. Its purpose is to make recovery after the attack more difficult. It goes not after the industrial devices, but after the workstations used to configure them. It's executed by the launcher, uh, either one or two hours, depending on the specific sample, after the ICS payload modules. So remember that SCADA configuration software I showed you earlier? So this module wipes files belonging to such SCADA software, as you can see on this screen. Also, it renders the machine unbootable by corrupting the registry, and finally crashes it by killing all, including system processes. So What's the effect? Well, as an engineer at a substation, you have circuit breakers being reopened, protection relays not responding, and when you sit down to fix the problem, you find that your SCADA software is gone. Another demonstration of the importance of backups. So, as you've seen, industry's capabilities are rather versatile. It caused a blackout in Ukraine, but it's also configurable and can be repurposed to attack power grids around the world with modifications even here in the US. It's a scalable and dangerous weapon against ICS, as we've said, the biggest since Stuxnet. But the gist of the threat is not only in the malware itself, but in the skill set and dedication of the malware operators. It's not just about being able to code this stuff, but about being able to, and they proved that they were able, uh, to become familiar with the architecture of the industrial site that they want to target. What devices there are, what commands to send them, and what will happen as a, as a result. Now let's hear more from Dragos.
Perfect, thank you. So this portion of the talk, what we really wanted to focus on was some of the things that are going on in the community now, as well as the so what factor of a lot of the good work that Robert and Anton did to, to seeing what it actually does for electric grid operations and some of those potentially risky scenarios. Uh, you'll notice obviously that we use a different name for it. A lot of that spawned out of the, the fact that when we first got the analysis, which uh, ESIT made available uh, ahead of time for us, which we greatly appreciated, uh, we didn't actually have access to the samples, so we had to go sort of hunt and find the samples themselves. And so a lot of the analysis, we weren't sure how much we could confirm, so we first named it uh, differently. Second of all, the malware itself actually calls itself by the crash function, so we named it after that, and being lovers of 80s and 90s movies, we figured of course crash override made the most sense. Uh, but uh, more importantly for us, a lot of our investigation focused not only on the impact scenarios, but on the human aspect behind this, on a group that Joe will talk about a little bit later that we call Electrum, which is the developers of the actual malware uh, and the ties that they have and, and why that's important, especially for US audiences. Uh, so from, from our investigation aspect, we had about 96 hours ahead of time from it dropping in Washington Post and Wired and a bunch of other places uh, to go out and find the samples, reverse engineer it, uh, work with the community and find out that we needed to inform a bunch of the, the US community as well in the search around the world. Uh, I will note that um, like Ben Miller and I got to work on the 2015 investigation into Ukraine and I was very critical at the time of the US government, uh, mostly because the attack occurred December 23rd, but the first time the US government actually even acknowledged that it occurred was two months and a day after it occurred, which I felt was not exactly information sharing and not exactly useful to the community. Um, so on that backdrop, I do want to note that I was actually really impressed this time with how people responded. Uh, we worked very closely with our industry partners at EEI, NERC's EISAC and the DHS. Uh, ben, Sergio, Joe and I were in front of various Senate level folks briefing up the actual impact scenarios and why we do need to take this uh, seriously. And it was awesome to actually see the ICS CERT and US CERT and folks publish out a day one type advisory uh, and getting the information out there to the community. So if I'm going to be super critical, I also want to do a sort of the hat tip to the folks that did it right. Um, so I was really excited that they, they took this seriously for the community. So what I want to note before I turn it over to Joe to talk about the, the adversary group is when we look at, at industrial control systems, there tends to be an IT security approach sometimes where people over focus on vulnerabilities or over focus on malware. And at the end of the day, your threat is a human. It's a human team. It's not the malware that's the threat. Uh, and particularly in this case, what I found most interesting uh, after looking at this is there is no simple fix. It's not a patch. It's not a vulnerability. Uh, there might have been like the Siemens vulnerability as an aspect, but that wasn't needed to actually execute the attack itself. Uh, the more, more important piece is human operators and adversaries learned grid operations and they codified that grid operations and lessons learned from 2015 and put that into a scalable framework. That has direct impact to everybody. Uh, one of my buddies, Sim Conway, likes to joke around that policy members sometimes look at this and go, well, Ukraine is on the other side of the internet. Uh, but not so much when we're looking at capabilities like this. Uh, that tradecraft and that knowledge of how to do this is instantly transposable. And of course, I, I feel very strongly that targeting civilian infrastructure is at least the one thing that we should rule off and say that it's inappropriate. Um, so when we look at this case, I, I think we're seeing an, an evolution adversary tradecraft. I'll come back to that at the end of the talk on sort of how to prepare for that going forward. But for now, let's, let's take a break to, for Joe to talk about the Electrum group and really some of our investigation of the human side and why it has interesting links for us. Thank you, Rob. So to switch gears a little bit, internally we named the group, the actor, the entity behind this is Electrum, more of an internal tracker, something to refer with our customers, you know, in and of itself not meaningful on its own. You know, you look at the capabilities that were involved in the attack as we analyzed it, you know, they have this malware framework, framework, not a piece of malware, but a modular framework of different pieces that can fit together in order to cause a desired effect within an environment, as Rob was explaining, they had to learn grid operations to do so, that then could walk down the steps of what sort of impacts you could have in that environment, everything from, you know, turn the power off by manipulating breakers through that manipulation of the information flow to deny the operators the capability of system recovery or system operations. But all of this has to be put in the context, you know, you have a adversary with a motivation, the intellectually lazy thing to do or the obvious, you know, item of easy path of least resistance is like, oh, happened in Ukraine, must be the Russians. Well, that's a possibility. I'm not going to go into attribution. However, based upon our analysis and access to non-public information, we were able to identify, based upon elements of this information and subsequent analysis, that there were links to the 
uh, actor known as Sandworm. Now, whether Sandworm is the SVR, the Mossad, or the proverbial 400-pound guy in his basement in New Jersey, I personally don't care about that. But in looking at this from a tradecraft and intention perspective, that is an interesting point because we look at the Electrum Group as being the ICS actors and or developers for this environment that just so happens to be linked with this team. So take that what you will from a geopolitical standpoint. Again, I really don't want to go into that discussion because I don't think it's very helpful for us within the cybersecurity. Yes, I said cyber. I'm sorry. Space. <laughs> Later. Now, in orienting this attack to what occurred, when it occurred, so we look at the ICS kill chain. This is a concept that SANS has promulgated, and I think with you know some a uh, lot of help for the industry in breaking this into the attack within the IT environment and then attack within the operational technology or the ICS environment. Now, if you look at this as being the operation of a motivated group, and certainly we've hinted at this that you know this is a software package that has lots of different functionality built into it, a modular framework, but also a separate framework from being a traditional intelligence tool. So one element that we identified in our analysis is that while XF identifying information was stripped from the implant module, there were some strings that identified compile time still left within the initial implant that show that it was compiled in the 16th of December. And if you recall the timeline that Robert was going through earlier, the attack unfolded on the 17th. So someone had to compromise the IT network, dive into the ICS network in order to get to where we really care about an impact within the ICS space. So what we're seeing here is a actor with multiple different tool sets at their disposal to achieve an intrusion event, an intelligence collection event in order to start preparing the environment for the subsequent attack, remove those tools or use to a different tool set and then apply the physical impact or attack scenario that uh, Robert and Anton have gone over. Looking at the payload modules themselves, I'm not going to redo the technical analysis. The folks from ESA have done an outstanding job on that already. But rather, let's put this into an overall context. We've seen someone who was able to go out and reverse, in well, not reverse engineer, but apply three different methods of communicating to physical hardware that works within grid operations, as well as overcome a, an additional protocol used for grid monitoring and communication, and then on top of that build a destructive module in turn. Again, showing an intention to cause bad things, but also doing so across multiple attack pathways. So this wasn't someone who was just going out like, hey, whoopee, I found some interesting vulnerability or some unique aspect of something to attack. It's already been emphasized. There were no zero days involved. There were no real vulnerabilities, but rather someone who took the time to dive in, figure out how these protocols work, figure out different ways in which the environment that these can be applied, and then combine them into an overall framework so that it had the flexibility in question to have the desired effect within whatever op environment it was operating in. So the IEC 104 module, you know, this is just an overview again. Uh, but the important thing is that the actor in question here, whoever they are, you know, we call them Electrum, went to the trouble of figuring out how IEC 104 worked. They designed a piece of software that manipulated, took advantage of the legitimate functionality in order to use it for malicious purposes within the targeted environment. Looking at the way that the execution flows, so you can see that we start off with calling the exported function crash, hence crash override and yay hackers, uh, but then proceeding down the pathway of the legitimate IEC 104 um, application flow, so killing that comm service on the local host, interacting with the systems controlled further downstream, and then after a you know, the one to two hour time frame, calling the secondary crash function onto the wiper module in order to create the um, destructive effect within, within the hosted system. But let's put this into context. So it's very easy to like, holy crap, the electric grid is screwed, we're all going to die, lights are going to go off. Well, let's take a step back and see how this worked out. The actors in question here did their homework. That's been emphasized multiple times already. But not only did they do their homework, they had to tailor make some of these packages in order to have the intended effect. So is this going to want to cry, eternal, whatever we're doing right now? No, because if you look at how this is built, IEC 101 and 104 need a configuration module. What does that mean? It means that the actor in question had to be in this network, well, either that or was an operator within the network who decided he needed a pay raise and worked for someone else, but otherwise, someone had to map out this network ahead of time, someone had to identify the points of interest and figure out what things to attack. If you go to the more automated modules like 61, uh, 
50, et cetera, we see you know, a little bit more flexibility involved there, but at the same time still has to identify that the environment uses this equipment, has to identify where in that network environment you need to sit in order to impact those systems. So there's a lot of, sub of development work and application work that has to go in before these things can be delivered. So that's not a cause for like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about this because these places are hard to reach. No, that's not what I want you to take away from this, but I also want you to take away from this that this isn't something that can just be released out in the open and worm its way across the power grid and take down lots of things. Someone has to be in these networks to start with and have expend both the time, energy, and effort to orient and design the software in question to then have their malicious effect. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Ben who's going to walk over some concrete scenarios of how this affects the power grid. Great. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, so, so far we've really examined uh, crash override and the malware kind of in a laboratory setting, uh, kind of abstractly this is what it is, uh, but not understanding the context around it. Uh, so I'm going to briefly give like a five minute recap of uh, electric uh, grid operations and what that actually means and, and kind of uh, ground the audience to how this impact even occurs. Uh, so if you're um, familiar with computers, you may be. Uh, th there's concepts like uh, CPU, RAM, input, output. Those are uh, singular f uh, functions that a computer needs to operate. Uh, similarly with the grid, you have generation, so you have big spinny magnets that actually produce power. Uh, and then uh, that moves out into, steps up into high voltage into transmission tower. So these are the big steel structures uh, that you would see when you're on the highway uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then as it gets into these cities, into the neighborhoods, steps down into direct current, uh, into distributions. Uh, so these are the pull tops uh, and the uh, low, low voltage that's feeding uh, businesses, industrial sites, uh, your houses. Uh, within the context of crash override, uh, the areas uh, that we're focusing on are substation, substation automation. So this is seen at the transmission level, this is seen at the distribution level, and this is where all the action is. So if you are working on power systems, if you want to manipulate power flows, uh, you're doing that at the substation level. Uh, you'll see in the diagram there's a big metal shack there. Um, the, uh, the brains of the substation, uh, which is where all this action is happening, is in, in, that, con in, in that control house. Uh, so, uh, Robert mentioned the uh, C-Protect uh, protective relays. The protective relays are in essence the, the automatic brain function of the grid. Uh, so if you've been in a, uh, sitting in your house and there's a storm and your lights go out and then five seconds later they turn back on and then it goes out again and ten seconds later it, it flicks back on. That's not a human flicking the switch to, to see if uh, it's going on. What, what's happening is there's some sort of fault there. The, protect, the protective relay is uh, testing to see if the, uh, the fault cleared, so it's turning it on, turning it off. Eventually it gives up and it just leaves the power out and then that's where uh, line crews are dispatched and, and uh, uh, cut down the limb, whatnot, and restore power. The protective relay is the heart of, of uh, the, the um, system and how it protects itself. It really what it's doing is controlling the circuit breaker. Uh, so if the circuit breaker is open, it's de-energizing the line and that is uh, ultimately focused on protecting the equipment, the physical equipment uh, such as transformers uh, that are in that substation. Uh, these are the, the uh, protective relays are, are built into protective zones. Those zones have overlap uh, designed to protect the, the physical equipment, as I said, and, and becomes a key component of uh, the uh, crash override and, and how everything works together. So from an impact scenario, uh, it, it's, it's important to understand how all the modules can be used on top of each other to create different kinds of effects, or potentially create different kinds of effects. Um, it, and it, it's a nuanced discussion of, uh, uh, as uh, Joe and, and Rob were saying, that uh, the grid isn't going down. Uh, th there's a lot of dynamics at play on just uh, the individual substations and, and how they are organized in the overall system. Uh, but what, what ultimately you have is uh, um, you can start stacking the, the protocols on top of each other where you have uh, a rogue process opening a, a, a circuit breaker, thereby de-energizing the line. Uh, but you can also combine that with the DOS tool of the protective relay 
where, where the protective relay would maybe kick in or the remote operator would manipulate the protective relay to open, uh, close that circuit breaker. Well, now that, uh, that uh, protective relay is denial of service, so that's no longer remotely accessible. Uh, and then you can cut, start combining that with the OPC DA module, uh, which uh, could uh, put the, the output that the system operator is viewing at their HMI, uh, in the machine uh, interface, human machine interface, to put that status of what that circuit breaker is into a uh, out of bounds air where they, d they don't know if it's open or closed. Uh, so thereby limiting the, uh, the troubleshooting capability as well as the, the uh, ability to manipulate uh, uh, that equipment remotely. In addition to that, uh, as uh, Robert was outlining, um, the wiper functionality of, of uh, it, it's not just impacting the, uh, the software, the, the SCADA software that's on there, but it's impacting the configuration file for all these devices. So you saw some screenshots of the, uh, the Siemens gear, the ABB uh, protective relays. Those configuration files that are loaded in there, those are being, t instead of Word documents, Excel documents, access, uh, access documents that you're used to seeing in a traditional wiper, it's going after those configuration files, thereby hampering the actual restoration of this equipment uh, uh, and, and just delaying the return to service. Uh, so that gets into the dynamics of, well, why can't I have 500 instances of crash override just blank out a, a region? Uh, and it, it becomes a, a complicated engineering and physics discussion. Uh, but ultimately, you have a crash override, which is definitely a large step towards manipulating uh, grid systems, uh, substation automation systems. That's what it's designed for. But it's not really necessarily designed for at scale. It, it's designed to manipulate one substation here, one substation there. It's not synchronized. It's not talking to all of its instances in, in a way that can be synchronized and coordinated to have a large scale impact. Because at the end of the day, the the grid is a very large machine and it's synchronized. Uh, so you need that level of synchronicity in order to create a large scale thing. Uh, so crash override as it exists right now can cause uh, certain islanding small events of the, the, the um, substation or, or the small territory around it. But it's not going to scale into the aspect of uh, New York just went dark or, or we lost uh, the state of Texas uh, and th uh, there's no, no, no power there. That, that is not uh, capable today. Indeed, even just the, the model of North America, um, uh, so North America has had a power grid for a really long time, which means uh, the, a lot of the technology and the prot protocol stacks of IEC 101, 104, um, are not deployed in uh, North America traditionally. Uh, that's slowly starting to change, but we're, we're using uh, fundamentally different technology stacks. Uh, so that's not to uh, suggest that you can't create that uh, protocol stack and leverage that with crash override. But as it exists today, the findings that we have, it, it's not really applicable to North America as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Rob. So as Ben had the nuance, now I want to talk about the things that are going to come and the things that I think we should be prepared for. So as he mentioned, we're not to the point of cascading grid failure. I think a lot of the uh, folks out there always love to think about those scenarios. It's actually much harder than people will realize. And more importantly, from an adversary perspective, you actually would not be realistically confident of being able to pull it off. You'd have to pull the trigger on an attack with the understanding that it could absolutely fail in an undeterministic way. And that is a very interesting scenario for, for geopolitical conflict. Um, but, but here's now the less nuance and more of the, the scary side. So the fact that we've seen an adversary codify grid operations into a malware framework, one of the things that was very keenly obvious to us was that all of the functionality exhibited in the malware was not demonstrated in the Ukraine attack. In other words, they built in capabilities that wouldn't actually stack on top of each other for the event that we saw. We know that it took place there. We don't have the full investigation details, weren't involved in the investigation, we're doing the malware analysis piece. But we can confidently say from what actually occurred versus what we're seeing that they built more functionality into it than they needed. Uh, we also saw compile times, as Joe mentioned, but even references to code that they're still developing. And we also have intelligence on the Electrum group still being active today. Um, what that led us to believe and what it, well, I'll say uh, assess is that the crash override framework was built to target multiple sites. No, it's not going to have a 
cascading grid failure wanna cry type event, uh, you know, sort of put on top of that. But you could absolutely take human operations and put it into 10, 15, 20 different sites and cause disruption. Uh, when we were going through the 2015 investigation, one of the things that we noted is that, that uh, no, it was not a 400 pound hacker, it was around 22 people. When we look at the timing of the events on the network and the manual operations, is there would have been around 20, 20 or so folks in the first attack. And so we're looking at a well funded, well prepared team building something to target m uh, multiple locations. When we look again at the North American grid, I do think it's very, very complex and it adds that complexity which make it difficult. I don't expect to see crash overrides show up in North America, but I expect to see the trade craft that's been exhibited easily codified for other adversaries to take advantage of. And I think all of our grid operators out there need to be aware that these style of events are things that you do need to train and prepare for because we will see more of it. We are seeing increasingly complex and increasingly aggressive adversaries. And unfortunately to this day, no senior level policy makers of any government um, outside of Ukraine have come out and actually condemned either the 2015 or 2016 attack. Uh, in other words, somebody got away with attacking civilian infrastructure after 30 years of us complaining that civilian infrastructure is off limits and there was no actions for it. Not talking sanctions, not talking anything other than, hey, our hearts and minds with the people of Ukraine understand that this is civilian infrastructure and it would not fly here. That's not even been done to that level. So I think that we've done nothing but embolden the attackers and I think there's been an, a very concerning trend. One of the things that I want to note as well for folks is that the reason the Electrum to the Sandworm tie-in uh, tie is so important is the Sandworm team already compromised industrial infrastructure in the United States. So back in 2013, 2014, the Sandworm team targeted electric manufacturing and petrochemical environments across the United States with relative success. They're not in the position to kill people and do crazy things. That's where sort of the hype comes in. But obviously aggressive and doing the type of espionage they would need to do attacks. So to see that the same team that leveraged uh, espionage against us before is sort of outside of Ukraine, now they're in Ukraine doing destructive attacks and doing disruptive attacks, I think that is, that is very concerning not only from a technical perspective but also that, that political piece. So what I want people to do is not just like blindly take the Yara rule that we put out and go, I did it, I'm successful, I ran Yara against my system, congratulations guys. Like that's not the point. The point is I think indicators in this case are not that useful. So I want to say that again. I, I usually quote uh, my Intel director Sergio on this. Indicators are like PowerPoint. You look stupid for not using them but nobody likes them. So what I want to note here is I don't want you to use the indicators that we put out in the report or that ESA put out and go, okay, let's run this against our HMIs and our engineering workstations and we're good. I want you to do that for a training scenario in your own environments. Can I take some information about capabilities in our environment and can I go and do the type of incident response to security operations center practices in industrial environments to make this successful? You will find if you're a grid operator in, or an industrial operator in general that in your first scenario you're going to run into major roadblocks that you didn't anticipate and ironing those out ahead of the attack is what's most important here. The, the other thing I want to note in, in general about all of this is there's not an instant way to make this accessible to other industries. It's not as simple as swapping out a protocol payload and be like, oh, I can put Modbus TCP in this. Wow, I'm targeting manufacturing now. That, that's not that simple. It's around the actual operations knowledge that's been codified. But I, I do fully anticipate to see more adversaries learning our industrial environments and using them against themselves. If we can make the turbine spin faster, we can make it spin slower. Uh, it's interesting to be able to codify our knowledge on that and try to get ahead of it. The other thing I'll note, especially for the electric grid operators in the community that are thinking to themselves, well, what about X? Uh, you, will, you will note that there was a couple scenarios that we didn't cover. If you're in the electric community, you will get a notification out from proper government channels uh, later this week on some other potentially concerning scenarios. I didn't want to get up on stage and say, hey adversaries, here's what you did wrong. Here's how you could really screw us. Uh, so instead, if you're in the community and actually didn't know that, you'll get the, the report. Uh, I, I got to do one pulpit thing and say for all the journalists in the audience, it'd be really nice if this one didn't leak. Uh, I think we see a lot of like uh, TLP New York Times and stuff uh, these days and I would like to see this one not out there. Uh, so hopefully we can treat some of this information with respect seeing how we do have an active conflict going on in Ukraine and we probably don't want to give whoever it is uh, the resources to be a little bit better in their attack. So with that I want to open it up to questions. We've got about five minutes. Um, again, thanks to ESIT for passing us their analysis early on. It was fun to be part of this one. Uh, we'll take questions and then we'll take the rest of the questions all the way back out in the wrap room. Uh, so we just randomly call on people? No, yeah, thanks. Call on people? Yeah. Well, I can repeat it back. Okay. Did you guys see 
see any evidence of how they tested it to make sure it worked? Yeah. Great question. So the question was, this is pretty complicated. Did we see any evidence that they tested it before? Uh, I'll let Issa uh, take that as well but I'll note that in my analysis of the 2015 attack, uh, there was basically around 60 substations that were disconnected in the attack and exactly one of them was done differently. So at the time in our public report, we highlighted that that one was done differently and what it was was legitimate ICS protocols were being leveraged from the adversary side of the communications. And so we said that in a reasonable assessment, there was no reason to do exactly one different other than test a future attack. It's not something so simple to actually build an electric grid in your basement and test out type of attacks. So if you're already doing operations and attacks, you might as well uh, take advantage of that, that playground that you're in. So in my assessment, the 2015 and 2016 attacks themselves were linked as well and we saw early testing of this in 2015. Um, Robert and Anton, anything to, to add? Yeah. Is, it, is this on? Yeah. I think they definitely tested it. I mean if, if they w went to such lengths as creating this type of malware, it wouldn't make sense just to, you know, deploy it without without any sort of testing. But as I've shown you in, in the slides, there were many the, in, in communication payloads, uh, they had, you know, similar functionality, uh, all four of them. And so it's some more duplicate functionality because they probably didn't know exactly what, what systems the Ukrainian uh, substation was using. So they wanted to prepare for all, the, all these types of scenarios. Uh, yes, it's not possible to have a lab simulating the whole, the whole uh, power grid in house, but you can actually get these devices and, and test, deploy the functionality of these payloads. We even did this testing ourselves during the research. So, uh, yes, I, I would agree that they did test the malware. Perfect. We have one more question and then we'll get going on this side of the room. Anybody? Nope. Anybody else? Yes. You can just yell it at me, man. It's all good. I'll take first swag on that and say uh, the the question was pretty depressing outcome for a lot of impact. I would argue the exact opposite. Uh, there's only ever been two cyber attacks in history that took down a portion of a power grid. So to actually be able to do it and prove that you can do it in a scalable way is pretty significant. I, I view the attacks that are going on in Ukraine as more proof of concept at times. Also sometimes the impact is not as simple as understanding from the technical piece. There's also geopolitical and psychological aspects to the populace in doing that. So I would, I would say from at least my analysis and perspective is we've seen an adversary step over what we've defined as red lines in the international community before with a lot of success and as they keep pressing those boundaries and realizing what they can do going forward, it's opening up the, the future for how they do conflict. Um, yeah. And actually to build on that just a little bit, so if you look at the progression of attacks from 2015 to 2016 is that you see in 2015 as uh, Robert outlined and showed part of the video, you know, like someone put in a remote terminal, uh, remote desktop program on a operator machine and interacted with the equipment directly. You know, getting there requires some work, but that's not a terribly sophisticated attack. What we see in the progression of 2016, though, is the development of a framework where, you know, yes, you need a config file, yes, you need some operation of the environment, but at that point, you have a development team that can produce a, wait for it, a cyber weapon maybe, or something else along the lines that can have an impact, gives it to an operator that knows F all about how electric grid operations work, and they just simply have to deploy it. So what you see is an increase in scalability, increase in technical sophistication, and as uh, Rob was hinting at, also a signaling capability that like, hey, we have this capability now, this is, exists, and not only that, but albeit in a limited fashion for the only place it's been demonstrated, it does work. I would actually agree with, with your assessment when you posed that question that uh, I think I feel it's it's in big contrast. The capabilities we all we all agree that they're pretty you know sophisticated, both the malware and the capabilities of of the attacker. But it's quite you know in big contrast with the actual effect. I mean, it wasn't actually several hours in the in the recent in the 2015 outage. It was only about one hour and one substation. So. And it happened around midnight. So no, that was not such a big deal. And it begs, begs the question, so what's the, what's the explanation for that? So either they failed somehow. I mean, yes, they, they did try this operation, but they were not 100% uh, successful. Or it was a test for bigger things to come. So these are the unanswered questions we are left with. Perfect. Well, we're out of time. Thanks again for everybody that came. Thanks again, uh, Issa, for having us with you. And uh, thanks, my Dragos guys. And uh, take care, all.